Welcome to OECD Podcasts, where policy meets people. What is human capital? In short, human capital is you. What you know, your skills, your knowledge, how you cooperate with others, uh, the new ideas that you come up with. It's also more than any one person. Human capital is about all of us, collectively, about a country's entire working age population. Basically, everybody uh, between the age of 15 and 64 or 75. How what each of us knows what we can do, and how this then affects the economy as a whole. Economists tend to see human capital as a key driver of a country's wealth and well-being. They've long argued that by improving their human capital, countries can become more productive and also reduce inequality. However, to do this, countries need to be able to measure their human capital. And that isn't always so easy. It's been a bit difficult to prove the link between uh, human capital and uh, productivity growth. Nor is it always clear what countries can actually do to improve their human capital, how specific policies can help or hinder their efforts. I'm Kate Lancaster. To help unpack human capital, why it matters for you and for your country, I'm speaking today with two OECD economists, Zuzana Smidova and Yarmila Botev. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Hello. Hello, thank you. So, how does a person get their human capital? Where does it all start? Uh, You basically learn uh, things right from the early age, and that's accumulating human capital. You learn to speak, read, write, then you go to school, and then you get some training in your job. And this is all building your human capital. Countries invest into human capital via education. Uh, all the schooling people get, all the lifelong learning, all the retraining programs. Health is also considered a uh, human capital because if you're in a good shape, you can work more efficiently. If you're very sick, you're unlikely to work. So we can see why human capital is important for a person, how it makes up who they are, adds to their value, helps them to find work. But why is human capital important for countries? Well, countries are made up of people Uh, So in the same way as uh, human capital benefits uh, an individual person, for example, if you want to have a better life, a better job and better earnings, uh, you invest into your skills and education, um, countries uh, can do that as well. They can also invest in the education, in the health of their citizens, and so raise their overall productivity and well-being. And that's what we economists like to see. (laughs) Let me add to that, that um, in theory, economists believe that human capital is a big driver of growth and it can help deal with many issues of inequality. You said in theory. So can you tease that out a little more, what you mean by that? In practice, it's been a bit difficult to prove the link between uh, human capital and uh, productivity growth. In these statistical decompositions that we do, this link has been either weak or Um, counterintuitive or missing. And that's why we've looked into it. So what's a statistical decomposition? It's basically when we try to explain growth by certain factors that the economies have at their disposition. It's the capital, it's the labor, it's the technological progress, it's the human capital. And so when you measure human capital, are you able to really measure it itself at the country level or how does that work? That's the cause of the problem, so to say, uh, why we uh, haven't been able to find a good link between productivity and human capital, because on a country level, it's really difficult uh, to measure it. And that's why uh, economists uh, so far have been using like a standing measures. For example, the uh, number of years an average person spends in education. So is there a good way to measure human capital then? Are we able to start to move beyond these stand-ins? Yes, we can take these uh, years spent in education as a basis. And on top of that, uh, we can also uh, try and use and enrich the analysis uh, for the so-called returns to education. That means uh, how much uh, you actually gain by spending an additional year in education. So the the returns on each additional year that you spend? That's right. Okay. And um, there's a good reason to think that these returns uh, would be different for when you're in primary school, where you learn fairly essential skills like uh, reading and writing. Um, 
So these returns are then different in the secondary school, where you also learn a lot, but uh, the returns are not as high as in the... Because you already have the good basis. Indeed. Uh, and then at the university, there again, you acquire relatively specialized knowledge in a certain field. So there again, the returns are quite high. And this is what we economists call U-shaped uh, marginal returns. <laughs> Tell me more about that. Well, actually, if you were to chart these returns uh, as they follow each other, primary, secondary, tertiary education, you would have relatively high returns, then somewhat lower, and then again high returns. So that's that would so create this It C-shape. literally makes a curve on the chart yes, that's indeed. like a U. Okay. Um, and so... You've applied this, this new new technique. Um, what, what countries have you been looking at with this? We basically looked at a sample that covers all the countries in the world. Uh, the World Bank does a very good job of collecting these uh, rates of return, and this is what we looked at. And we looked at not only what are these rates of return uh, today or the latest available year, but also how they've been evolving over time across countries. So it's difficult to imagine that these rates of return are the same uh, in Kenya and Germany, for instance. Mm. However, many previous studies made exactly that assumption. Uh, They applied the same rates of return to all countries. And this is uh, one area where our new measure of human capital adds uh, something new because it's trying to take account of these differences across countries and over time. And so what has your analysis shown? Basically, this way uh, we are able to better measure the human capital, and then we can try and make the link to the productivity of a country or to the well-being of a country. And we have indeed found that with this new measure, countries that have uh, more human capital, which are countries like, for example, Germany, uh, Australia, Iceland or Japan, are indeed more productive than countries which have lower levels of uh, human capital, like, uh, say, Portugal uh, or Brazil or India. So you've been able to quantify something that has seemed logical intuitively. You've really been able to measure and map it out to show... It seems logical to say someone who has a high level of human capital will be more productive, will be more effective in their job, but now you can show that at the country level. That's right. It would seem to me then that the next logical thing to ask is what do countries need to do to boost their human capital to ensure they have enough to stay productive, to become more productive? What kinds of policy measures can they take? You know, when we think of human capital, we really look at all these things from a macro perspective. Uh, That means all the policies that we've spotted that work for human capital, they work at the highest level, at the country level, when we measure human capital. There can be a whole different view on things. These number of studies show things at the micro level, at the level of schools, at the level of students. And there... Imagine even at the level of individuals. Absolutely. And this is not something that we uh, examined. You know, for us, human capital is all those people, all that working age population aggregated at the country level. But we looked at uh, which policies improve human capital across countries. And uh, we found, unsurprisingly, that education matters a lot. Mm. And within education, uh, certain policies have a potential to make a real difference. These are, for instance, attendance of pre-primary education. So preschool, Preschool, kindergarten. Preschool, kindergarten, that's right. Uh, This improves human capital, and it has a stronger effect in countries where a large share of children come from families with low socioeconomic background, more disadvantaged families. So families where the parents themselves may not have high human capital, or where where they don't have the education themselves, uh, where their incomes are low, Mm. where there are issues of uh, poverty, uh, where there are high inequalities. And what about how schools are organized and run? Yes, uh, that matters uh, too. We found that in countries where schools are more autonomous and they have higher shares of fully qualified teachers, uh, these countries tend to have a higher human capital and thereby uh, productivity. We also found that uh, lower student and teacher ratios are favorable for human capital, though the evidence from the education literature can be sometimes mixed. Uh, So what about policies that don't work? Things countries are doing that maybe they could redirect those resources elsewhere? 
Yes. For example, there's a policy that's called uh, early tracking of students. It basically means uh, that uh, children are separated uh, into various uh, school tracks based on their abilities or performance uh, at school. And if this is done very early on, this may be actually harmful to human capital. Similarly, if there are barriers to how people can finance their university education, for example, if there's fees and maybe less available loans, this is also not very good for human capital. So we know then that policies can help or can hinder the development of human capital, the development of productivity at the national level. But by how much? Do we know what the impact of policies are? Can we really measure the extent of the impact? That impact will differ on uh, where the country stands uh, in those policies. What is their starting point vis-a-vis the the OECD best performing countries? So, you know, this impact will be very different for each country depending exactly on uh, where they they are now and where they want to get to. And I would imagine as well that the full impact of any policy reform, that's going to take time. Indeed. I mean, if you think about it, if you implement an educational reform now, that's going to impact students who are basically children uh, at the moment. So it will take some time till they grow up and actually, uh, you know, enter the workforce uh, and until this reform actually feeds through to the economy. That's actually one reason why the countries should do the reforms as soon as possible. And can you give us a few uh, examples of countries, what they're doing, the impact of a particular reform? Well, for instance, uh, you can see that France uh, has recently decreased uh, the age uh, at which children start school. Uh, It used to be um, four years, uh, now it's three years. So that's clearly a measure that goes in the right direction based on our analysis. So we did an exercise uh, where we um, looked at um, countries which uh, fared uh, the worst uh, in each of these policy areas. And we looked at what would happen um, if they moved uh, or improved their policies to the level of uh, three best performing OECD countries. And for example, in the area of uh, pre-primary education, um, countries like uh, Turkey or Chile could improve their productivity by as much as um, four to six percent over the long term by sending more children to uh, pre-primary education. Let me add An example, when you have difficulties financing your higher education, you are unlikely to continue studying. And so the country's uh, overall human capital will be lower uh, than it would have been otherwise. And if we take an example of countries where financing your higher education is relatively easy, uh, we can think of uh, the UK or Australia or the US, where there are in, uh, in place systems or loans that you can take out for financing your higher education and you will pay only after you finished and depending on the level of income on your wage uh, when you finished. Uh, so when so you students who are making a lower income when they leave university will have more time, uh, more flexibility and repayment? Yes, that depends. I mean, that's different. These details are different in every country. But the general idea is that if your earnings, if your wage is not uh, above a certain level, you don't have to, re- you don't repay that uh, loan or you pay it longer uh, over time than somebody who's making three times uh, that you are once, once you get a job. Well, I'd like to ask you a last question that we're asking a lot of guests on the podcast this year. If you were speaking to a 15-year-old student, a young person, what would your advice be for them on developing their human capital? That's a really good question. I would say study as much as you can while you can and then uh, continue learning uh, while you're on the job because we clearly see the benefits of education in terms of future earnings, uh, but also in terms of satisfaction with life uh, and general well-being. And secondly, uh, I would add that uh, health is very important as well. So uh, while you're studying, maybe don't forget to go for a run Mm. uh, and keep yourself in a good shape. I would like to advise uh, the 15-year-old uh, not to not to learn just uh, at school <laughs> or not to rely on formal education only, uh, but uh, to be open and to keep on learning um, the whole uh, life 
long on the, whether it's on the job or whether it's elsewhere like i don't know learning a new language or learning a new skill that's always helpful to invest in yourself thank you very much susanna and yarmila it's been a pleasure discussing human capital with you today i'm kate lancaster thank you for listening to oecd podcasts You'll find much more about human capital, why it matters, and how your country measures up at oe.cd slash human dash capital. To listen to other OECD podcasts, find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and soundcloud.com slash OECD.